Welcome to the Exposium podcast, Wines of the Future. Where are we coming from? Where are we now? And where are we heading? My name is Gabrielle Zavona, and with top international experts, we'll be discussing the past, present, and future of the wine industry fast forward in 50 years. We're delighted to welcome fraud wine hunter Maureen Doney for a Vinexpo Wines of the Future talk on how to fight counterfeiting. Hello, Maureen. Hello. How are you? I'm good, thank you. On a video that appears on your website, winefraud.com, we see you at work, armed with a microscope and a ruler, and it reminded me of certain movies in which a profiler is hunting for the evidence of a murder. Maureen, you've been sniffing your way through fake bottles since a few decades now, which owes you the nickname of the Sherlock Holmes of wine. This is classy. <laughs> you advise the world's top collectors in purchasing, selling, and managing their collections through your firm, Shea Consulting, founded in 2005. In 2015, you launched winefraud.com to help assist both the wine trade and collectors to identify wine fraud and counterfeiting in global markets, as well as as how to authenticate fine wines. It is a huge database of 40,000 images of both authentic and counterfeit bottles, labels, ink, corks, and capsules that you gather to assist your members in authentication. And last but not least, you more recently created Chevolt, a blockchain-based solution to proving authenticity and provenance of a bottle for its entire lifespan. So, Tell us, Maureen, what are the main steps to undertake to recognize a fraud wine? First of all, I have to say that that 40,000, you know, images is, uh, that is a rather dated one. My database is now close to two terabytes. So I think we had 40,000 images on wine fraud about, I don't know, six years ago. So it's grown quite a lot. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, and the, one of the reasons is that what we do when we, when we authenticate is we photograph the bottles professionally, regular, but then we also take a lot of microscope images. And the microscope images are very important for, you know, looking at ink and looking at age or aging and glue. And so what we do is we look at the bottles forensically and we try to figure out if all the pieces fit together. You know, were they all produced at the same time? Have they grown up together? You know, it's kind of like if you look at a If you look at somebody who's got the body of, you know, a 70-year-old, but they have a face of a 25-year-old, you know that maybe some work has been done. So, you know, we try to make sure the, the capsule and the cork actually match the aging on the label and that all the different labels match. Because a lot of times uh, for old and rare wine, the, the different pieces of a bottle will be produced and aged separately and then kind of all smashed together. So we look for that consistency. Um, we also look for straight up, you know, is the information correct? You know, was that the 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 type of, especially in France, um, you know, you have many different types of of businesses, and as generations change, the type of the business might change. It might go from associate civil to something different. You know, are they proprietaire? Is it a négociant? So all these little little pieces of information are are important as are the, the information about importation and, and, and different uh, markets. So a lot goes into it. It's, it's, it's a lot more than one might think. Now, recently, it has, you know, the game has changed a bit because we're, we weren't for a long time seeing much old and rare, and we were seeing more kind of mass-produced recent vintages. But interestingly, in the last couple of months, my team all over the world has been finding more old and rare. What was the most surprising and obvious wine fraud case that you, you had to face in your career? Well, I think Rudy Cornea won. I mean, you know, the, that whole thing was so obvious. It was, it was an open secret in the wine industry that John Capon was selling counterfeits. And, you, you know, as soon as Rudy started bringing, well, the first time he ever brought me bottles when I was at Zaki's, I knew that something was, was very fishy. Just to remind, uh, you know, you actually appear on a Netflix documentary called Sour Grape that retraces the, the full story of what was a massive wine scam that was led by this man, Rudy Cunyawan, from 2000 to 2010, before he was sentenced with 10 years of jail, right? Yes. Correct. So this was obvious. This was the most obvious case you had to deal with. It was. And, I, and I, I, I do love the film Sour Grapes, but it's not the full story at all. 
Why is that so? No, but they just, there's a lot of information that is, that is missing, that is incorrect. I mean, it, you know, it's stated in the film that Rudy was buying, was spending a, a million dollars a month on, on wine. And that's just not true. I mean, the only person that ever said, the, the source for that information was Rudy. He told a journalist he was spending a million dollars a month on wine. And she repeated it, she printed it, and she keeps repeating it. it. It's just not true. He would bid at auction, and it would it would look like he was buying a million dollars worth of wine, but he would default on most of it. So it was all for show. And it was very obvious from the beginning that these guys were involved in a scheme because Rudy had gone, he was a young man, he was my age, so at the time, he's younger than me, actually. You know, he was in his, in his mid-20s, and he was coming up with cases and cases of the most rare wine in the world. You know, 1961, Latour Pomerol. In 2005, he suddenly had, you know, as, as John Capon wrote in an auction catalog, just under three cases, all from the same importer and in his possession for decades. Well, that would have meant that Rudy was buying wine when he was in diapers. <laughs> so, I mean, that was just, it was clearly lies. When I was at Morell and Company in 2000, 2001, we actually did have an old collector who had purchased a case of 61 Latour Pomerol from either Morell or Sherry Lehman from some, some very old established merchant. And we debated for a month what to do with that case because we could find no records of a full case of 1961 Latour Pomerol being sold anywhere in the world, you know, for decades. It's just, it was, it's such a rare wine. And all of a sudden this kid comes up with, you know, with just under three cases of it. So it was very obvious to me that this was a scam. But the the thing that, that really got me was that I asked him for receipts. Where did you buy these? And he could not come up with a receipt. He ended up after about two weeks sending a fax of a fax of something written in Chinese. And I said, no. You know, I mean, it, it, in, in 2002, 2003, you should have been able to show me a credit card receipt or a bank transfer. Could a similar case happen today? Yes. I mean, absolutely. If people don't ask for receipts. I mean, that's one of the things that I, that I find very odd about the wine industry. It is so opaque and people are so secretive about where they get their wine that we are inviting these kinds of frauds. You know, in 2008, Rudy sold over $30 million worth of wine through Acromero Condit. And if, if at the age of 27 or 28, a kid walked into you know, a reputable auction house with $30 million worth of jewelry, people would have said, okay, where did you get this? Show us, prove to us that you own this. But for some reason in the wine industry, that doesn't happen, um, which is why I think that provenance needs to be addressed just as much as is authenticity. There's no such thing as a counterfeit bottle that doesn't start with the counterfeit tale of provenance, right? Right. There has to be a lie. So that was the most obvious case. Now, what was the most subtle one? I think the most subtle is what we are seeing today, which is truly scary in terms of the fact that because this has been proven to be such a lucrative fraud, and because even when caught, people are rarely subject to much punishment. You know, maybe they get a small fine. Um, Alexander Ayugov, who called himself Alex Anakin, was a, a Russian guy who was making counterfeit DRC for many years. And he was finally caught and he was arrested in Switzerland and extradited to France. And he got time served, which was maybe a couple days, maybe a week, and a 150,000 euro fine. And if you're selling Domaine de la Romane Conti, 150,000 euro fine is not very much. As a result of the lack of prosecution and, and the low punishments, um, organized crime has looked at this and said, well, that's a good game to get in. You know, if they get caught trafficking humans or trafficking drugs, they're going to go to jail for real time. But if they get caught trafficking wine, it seems like nobody cares. So what we're seeing today is a very different kind of fraud that is much more subtle. So you would say it's, it's organized by the mafia today? Yeah. There are organized crime organizations all over the world, and not so much in the U.S., but in Europe and in Asia. And sometimes they work together in Europe and in Asia. They are mass producing. They are, they are doing commercial level production 
of counterfeits. And unfortunately, their replicas are very hard to distinguish from the real thing because they have, you know, producers in, in, in an effort to combat this fraud, producers have moved to digital printing and they have their labels digital printed. And a lot of them are including invisible ink and micro writing. And they have special glass made, you know, with special markings or their name or, or something. And they, you know, they have tissue paper that wraps the bottles and they put them in original wooden cases that are banded. And all of those things are branded so that they are unique to that producer. So is there a larger diversity of wine subjected to fraud today? Or is it still, you know, like top wines mainly? There's a lot of different types. But but the problem is that, the, that these bad guys are taking all of those different pieces and having them replicated professionally. So like if you look at the Sasakaya fraud, They had they, the glass was embossed and the labels were professionally printed with invisible ink and the tissue paper looked exactly the same as authentic, you know, and they had OWCs and the OWCs had Sasakaya bands and those OWCs went into cardboard boxes that were professionally printed. So that is a much more subtle fraud. And it takes that really is going to take law enforcement and producers to realize that, hey, we didn't send. 10,000 cases of this vintage to that market. It was a, a wash with counterfeit yellowtail. Yellowtail is is a, a commercial, you know, production. It's lower end. It's sold a lot in in pubs and things like that. So it actually went into pubs and into stores in the UK all around. Absolutely. And that was a, you know, that was that was Chinese and European organized crime working together to make that happen. So We're now seeing, you know, wine fraud in across the, the entire range. So it has been progressing, actually, and not decreasing as we could think of, because there's a technical progress as well to protect the wines. Well, there's not enough technical progress to, to, to protect the wines. Unfortunately, right now, almost all the solutions out there are cosmetic. And those cosmetic solutions, that invisible ink means that when a vendor who thinks that they've gotten the wine through, you know, the gray market, but legitimately through the gray market, and they, they look at the, the label and they see the invisible link, they go, okay, great, this is authentic. But it's not because it's, it's just a very much more subtle. And unfortunately, the problem is getting bigger because it is affecting, you know, all the different layers of the quality scale. It is not just French wine. It is not just white wine. It is not just red wine. It is not just still wine. There's counterfeit champagne. There's, you know, and then spirits are even a bigger problem. According to the World Health Organization, 25% of all alcohol sold in the world is illicit. So that means it's either counterfeit or adulterated or, or something. Could it have an impact on health as well in terms of what is inside the bottle? Absolutely. Alcohol kills about 100 people. Counterfeit alcohol kills about 100 people a year in Europe. And that sounds like a lot, but it's not a lot when you consider that counterfeit pharmaceuticals kill about 100,000 people a year globally. And that's why the pharmaceutical industry does a lot to protect their, and when I say they do a lot, they spend, the, the, the producers of pharmaceuticals spend millions and millions and millions of dollars a year combating fraud. Now, they're much larger companies. They make a lot more money. Unfortunately, most of these People whose, whose wine get counterfeited are families. You know, they're, they're generational families. They're, they're farmers. Their heart and soul goes into the wine, and it's, it's a bit of liquid history. They don't want to have to deal with this problem. They don't have the resources that pharmaceutical companies have. And um, it, it's, I think it's a lot more difficult that, you know, they're not giant corporations. They're, they're families. In 2017, you launched Chevolt, an innovative solution to trace wines through the blockchain and NFTs. Could you explain how this certification process works for the least geek of us? So this is a problem that I've been trying to figure out a solution for. It's one thing to sit here and complain about the problem and talk about the bad guys. But in the end, what everybody wants to do is solve the problem. So when I learned about the blockchain very early on, you know, I'm in Silicon Valley. I'm from Silicon Valley. I was really excited and I realized that this could actually be the solution that would bring the transparency that the, that the industry needs to 
defeat a lot of this fraud. And so, you know, I spent a couple of years developing it. And, and one of the big issues that we have is that you cannot read a chip through metal. And most fine wines have capsules that are made of tin, so you can't read through them. Well, working with my, my partners at Enoplastic, which is the world's largest capsule producer, we have come up with a solution whereby we can have a capsule that is mostly tin, looks and feels exactly like the capsules today, so it doesn't change the look and feel of a bottle. I think that's important. I don't want any some big, huge thing coming out from under the capsule or some you know, bubble tag or all those are, again, those are feel good solutions that don't, don't really make a difference. And, and more importantly, you have to be in direct proximity to that bottle in order to scan it. And nobody purchases wine direct. Nobody purchases wine being in direct proximity to the bottles, um, not fine wine, at least. You don't go to the store and decide to spend $50,000 on futures, right? Right. That's done via phone, via email. So the kinds of wines that, that we're looking at, although it, the solution would fit even commercial wine, but they wouldn't need the certificate. So the, the solution is that we put this chip under the capsule, under this proprietary capsule. And then the capsules go on the bottling line, just like they would. There's no big difference. There's no change. So the one thing that we put on the bottling line is this piece that reads the bottle, takes a number of pictures of it, um, captures any unique identifiers like serial numbers or lot numbers, things like that. And a blockchain certificate is made for each bottle. And then the producer can compel their supply chain to scan the bottles in and update the provenance. And, and that doesn't have to happen on a, on a bottle by bottle basis. The chip that we use is a, is a pretty dumb chip and dumb chips are good. You know, I think of uh, there's, 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 Cutting edge technology, and then there's old technology. And when you layer them, you come up with the best solution. So the chip that we use is kind of like a rock. And the good thing about a rock is it'll be around for a long time. The other thing that's good about this chip, uh, being a dumb chip, is that you can actually scan an entire palette at once. So all the, you know, the, the, when the bottles move from the chateau to the negotiant, the negotiant to the importer distributor, to, from the importer distributor to the retailer, at each phase, you know, the case or the pallet or the partial pallet can be scanned or the bottle can be scanned and updated with that provenance information in the blockchain. And then when the retailer sells it to an individual, they can actually monetize this and they can charge that person and have the certificate put in that person's name. And if that person ever goes to sell the bottle again, there is a hyperlink to the certificate that can be made available online. So on Wine Searcher or in an auction catalog, and we actually did this in 2019, we did a couple million dollars and every bottle's ledger was made available in the online catalog as a little URL and people could click on it and they could see the actual certificate of authenticity and provenance. And it has pictures of the actual bottle, um, a description of the, of the conditions at that time, when it was authenticated, by whom, and all of that. Now, obviously... And, and, and any provenance information that we had, you know, that it was purchased from K&D upon arrival in, you know, 2010. It has been in the ownership of this person. Now, individuals' names can be confidential or they can be listed, um, but the sale can never be confidential. So bringing more transparency and... Uh... Correct. So that people can actually see, you know, the life, this bottle, if it's bottled at the Chateau you know, or, or the domain, it'll say, this is the date that it was bottled. And this is the store that ended up with it. All the other information will be in that blockchain ledger, but at least people can see that it's direct, that it's not gray market. Because right now what we have is a whole bunch of people who make, they make up stories that, oh, this is Chateau Direct. Really? Like, how, who are you that you, that you are such a big guy that you got Chateau Direct? I mean, did you go through a negotiant? Did you go through an importer? I mean, Chateau Direct means you walked to the Chateau and you took bottles away. That doesn't mean you know that it came from the Chateau via three other steps. And we want to eliminate that. With this type of technology, can we imagine that by 2075, wine fraud will be an old story? Mm, uh, I would love to say yes. But... <laughs> In 71 AD, Pliny the Elder wrote 
about counterfeit Falernia. He, 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 was, he was observing his friends waxing and waning poetic about, about some Falernia wine that they were enjoying. And he, he considered himself such a gourmand and, and such a great palate that he knew that it wasn't real Falernia. Throughout time, you know, in the 1300s, you know, there, there, there were issues in France. And I mean, every, if you think of Chateau de Pop that has the, the, the arms on the glass, that's, that's an anti-fraud solution. So as much as I would love to say that technology is going to answer this, we can never rest. We, we've got to stay vigilant because crooks are smart. If they would just use their brains for good, it, the world would be a better place. But, you know, they're always going to try to figure a way around the system. And we'll always have to be a step ahead of them and on their tails at the same time. Thank you so much, Maureen, for your time. Thank you. Thank you for tuning into Wines of the Future. Don't miss the next episode and subscribe to this podcast. You can also leave us a comment and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Vinexposium.